If you take the example of walking down the street on a busy day, and you're walking down the street, and you see somebody coming towards you that uh, you know quite well, so you go to wave at them, and they just walk past without seeing you. Interesting to ask yourself, what would go through your mind at that point? What would you feel? Now, if you were feeling quite good that day, you might say, oh, they weren't wearing their glasses. You know, so, uh, or they, they were preoccupied with something. They didn't see me. That's fine. They, and you wouldn't think any more about it. But if you were feeling a bit vulnerable, a bit sad perhaps, or you had an argument with your partner or with the children that morning, then you might well conclude, why didn't they see Why didn't they acknowledge me? What have I done to upset them? I've, or I've lost a friend. That's always happening to me. I don't have very many friends. I wish I had more friends. And five minutes later, as you walk down the street, you're still preoccupied with it. And indeed, you might have missed several other people coming in the other direction yourself. Um, but you're still lost in subjectivity, just um, assaulted by a lot of these negative things. And that's why... You could see it as being negative propaganda against the self, just like propaganda in wartime is, uh, is, is uh, put about to try to convince people of things. Um, so a propaganda against the self is, I'm failure, I'm stupid, look what's happened to you. It's like something sitting on your shoulder, whispering in your ear how bad you are. Now, if you imagined saying you're a failure to somebody else, if you imagine saying to them, you're useless, you're a failure, and you did this all the time, a hundred times a day, you might imagine they'd feel pretty fed up about it, pretty upset, pretty depressed. But that's what depressed people do to themselves. This is what we do to ourselves when we're depressed. It's just we have this constant, what you might say, self-talk, running commentary on everything we do, saying, look at that, look at that, another example of how stupid you are. And just like if we were talking to somebody else, they'd feel really bad. So we feel bad to have this commentary running on and on and on. And meditation enables you to see that more clearly, to see the chatter of the mind just going on and on and on. And to begin not to try to, to repress it or suppress it, um, not to try to push it away, but just to notice it, to acknowledge it, even to welcome it and say almost with a smile, ah, there you are again. And when we greet it with a smile, there's a very, very curious thing happens. It tends to go by itself. It's a bit like opening the door to an unwelcome guest. And then the unwelcome guest stays for a while and goes. But if we bar the door, the guest simply stays outside hammering. So that's the attitude of meditation, to open the door to these things, to smile at them, and they stay around for a while, and then the irony is, they go. It's a major discovery. They just go, like a cloud that, that floats away. And then the sun's there, and the sun was there all the time. Uh, that's the remarkable thing, but when the clouds cover it, you often say, the sun's gone in. Well, the sun hasn't gone in. You know? um, it's still there. If you take Me and my colleagues were always interested in uh, how best to help people who are depressed. And we know that there's a therapy called cognitive therapy that works very well for depression. And it works by helping people to become aware of the thoughts that go through their mind when they're depressed. For many years, people thought that when you get depressed, these thoughts were just there as part, as a symptom of depression. So thoughts like, I'm worthless, I'm stupid, I'm a failure, nobody loves me, you know, it'd be better off if I were dead. Very serious thoughts like that. And people have treated these as a, as a symptom of depression. And what cognitive therapy does is say, well, they may be a symptom of depression, but they also make depression worse. They make it last longer. People start taking these thoughts seriously, believing them. And the more they believe them, the more they buy into them, and the more it makes them sad and depressed and so on. So cognitive therapy works by um, helping people to realize and uh, to change their thinking, to, uh, to look for the evidence um, now, when we came to another problem of depression, which is when people are better, how do they prevent themselves from getting depressed again? This demanded a new approach, it, because when people are well, their thoughts often disappear, these negative thoughts. 
So we needed an approach that actually taught people the same things that cognitive therapy had been teaching people, but that they could practice on any thoughts. And meditation is very useful for that, because in meditation uh, you uh, engage in practices. You, you sit, for example, focusing on the breath, and thoughts come up, any thoughts come up. So you can practice just seeing the thoughts come up, and seeing them come, seeing them stay a while, seeing them go. We use mindfulness over an eight-week program where people come for classes once a week for eight weeks, for two hours a week. And they learn intensive practices of meditation that have been used for over 2,000 years in the, in the East. And these have been adapted and um, um, developed in a way that people can use them on a daily basis. And when they do that, we followed people up in, now in two studies um, for 12 months after they had done this eight weeks. And people with more than three previous episodes of depression, it about halves the rates of relapse from, in one study, sort of 66% down to 37%. In another study, 78% down to 36%. So this is a, a remarkable result. I mean, if one had found a drug that actually could cut the relapse rate like that, it would be all over the world by now. One of the uh, things that's happening now is that many scientists who are therapists in, for other things other than depression, anxiety, eating disorders, insomnia, schizophrenia, are beginning to look to see if they can use and adapt this mindfulness approach to, again, help people stay well. Once they've got over the worst of an episode, um, then the question often is not um, how to live their lives, but also how to live their lives in a way that deals wisely with the possibility that these things will come back or will threaten to come back one day. And uh, meditation is extremely useful at helping people stay aware and awake, both for the early signs of symptoms, so they can take action earlier instead of waiting until it really boils up, um, but also um, begin, beginning to divert away from um, all these thoughts that uh, would worry them so much. One of the things that happens when people are doing this work is that at first it can seem a lot of work for very little apparent reward. Um, we invite people in the classes to take home tapes and CDs and practice six days out of seven uh, for about 45 minutes a day. And when there's been a lot of stress around sitting for 45 minutes or doing the body scan for 45 minutes, anything 45 minutes, is difficult. First of all, it's difficult to find that time in your day. You have to reconstruct your day because nobody's got an hour a day to spare. So one has to try to find that. That's difficult enough. Um, but then if you sit, you suddenly uh, perhaps are more aware for a while of all the pattern of the mind, the chatter of the mind that constantly goes on and on. And at first people think, well, this is not relaxing. This is not doing me any good. Because, you know, normally when you get something from your doctor to take home, it's supposed to make you feel better. This doesn't seem to make people feel better. But gradually people learn that they don't have to enjoy it. They just have to do it. And that they don't have to enjoy it, they just have to do it and see what they discover. And after three or four weeks, they start discovering all sorts of things. First of all, that time that they've taken for themselves each day becomes very precious to them, because it's a time to be with themselves, for themselves, not necessarily for anybody else. They notice that they're noticing more things in their environment. They're noticing small things. They're noticing a bird flying off. They're noticing a leaf on a tree. They're noticing things that normally they'd think just dismiss as ugly, like a drain pipe or something. So uh, they're aware, more aware of their environment. They feel more connected to their environment. And what's so powerful are those moments when normally they'd have spiralled down into a depression, when they would have said, you're worthless, you're stupid, when this voice would have arrived, as it were, whispering in their ear. And they have a moment where they feel themselves beginning to be sucked into the whirlpool of their emotions. But then they're able just to stand on the outside and say, I don't have to go there. This is just a thought. And the amazing sense of liberation, amazing sense of freedom 
that this gives them to be able to say this is an opportunity to practice and I don't have to get sucked into there and then when they notice that without having to do anything the voice itself disappears that's an amazing discovery that they don't have to do anything don't have to fix their problems they can just be with them and explore this awareness so um, these moments which often don't come straight away um, indeed uh, uh, you can't even expect them to be there because exactly how it strikes people will be different from person to person. When this happens, we're different from person to person. We tell people, you're only responsible for the input. You're only responsible for the input. You don't have to worry about the output. You don't have to worry about the outcome. Just do what it says to do and see what happens. Gradually, one by one, people make discoveries um, that uh, they would have never thought possible.